Chapter 5 CVN 77 Part 2 of 5 The surgeon wiped a tear from his eye. I apologize, but I couldn't resist. He waved toward the living room where well over two dozen ponies mingled in lively chatter. Why don't you get to know the others for a bit? I shall join you after I have a quick word with our esteemed host. Sure. Yakim watched Reed out of the corner of his eye as he left the small greeting room and walked into the large dining room which dominated over half of the house's ground floor. The furniture had been mostly moved to another room and multiple large pillows had been placed in the corner for those who wished to sit. As he expected, there were no humans in the mix. Well, I don't think I'd see any human prey to Alexia anyway. The teal stallion scanned the crowd, trying to find a familiar face. Most of them he had only seen in passing around town. Nearly every last one of them had a cutie mark making him slightly self-conscious. I must ask one of them later on how to obtain my mark. Perhaps extended prayer might reward me with one or at least insight. He saw no other distinguishing features in those present. The tribe split was almost in thirds, an understandable disproportionate number of mares were present as well. Not really irregular if that's our normal ratio. Lots of fine-looking mares though. Joachim spent more time checking out the mares than actually speaking with anyone and it was not long before Reed returned and raised his voice to be heard. May I have your attention please? He repeated it once more before the room quieted down to his liking. Thank you all for coming. The surgeon gave a fatherly smile to the others as Pack Rat quietly slipped into the side of the room. You all know why we are here. Her Royal Highness, Princess Alexia, is both a goddess and a gift. Unlike man, whose god or gods have always existed on a higher plane than us mortals, our goddess resides here on the mortal plane with us. While humans can only speak to their chosen deity through prayer, we can talk to ours face to face, over the phone, see her on TV, or even he paused with a smile, at the dinner table. It's the natural order of things really. Those on Equus have Celestia, Luna, Mi Amor Cadenza, and most recently Twilight Sparkle as their pantheon. So it was, that when we become ponies, that God knew we would need a patron deity here on Earth. And so he delivered unto us, Alexia Toon. Nearly all of the ponies present bowed their heads at her name. A mare in the crowd cocked her head in confusion and spoke out. Why would God give us a different deity to worship other than himself? Reed had been expecting that question. I asked myself that time and time again to try and understand God's design, and then it hit me. He scanned the crowd, searching for those with faith, and finding it present in all of them, Joachim most of all. All of man's religions and God himself follow a divine order. That he can only preside over one intelligent species, man. God is nothing if not loving, Reed continued with his impassioned speech. Even after the moment I grew hooves and I was forever out of his light, God still loved me. Alas, he cannot protect us as fully as he once did, so he gave the most deserving of us, Alexia Toon, Godhood. So that man has his God, and we ponies have ours. It was through this epiphany that I realized that every intelligent race has their God, and that by releasing us in Alexia's wings, the divine order is upheld. The earth stallion next to Joachim spoke out. The princess doesn't want to be a god though. I've asked her many times and she decries the notion out of hand every time. The last time she was rather heated in her rejection. He pawed the carpet in depressed recollection of the event. Several others murmured similar stories, yet Reed was not dissuaded. Yes. I myself have received such proclamations of humility. Just as our species here on earth is new, so is our princess. While it is true that she is adult mare, the princess is but a newborn babe in terms of her divinity. She does not yet possess the mind of a goddess and that is something we, her devout followers, can help her with. Reed pulled a stray chair over so he could prop one hoof on it to raise his head above the crowd while the other four legs swept over them. The princess is a secular goddess. And as such, she needs food, drink, and sleep like everyone else. But, that will only keep her worldly body alive. 
To help her grow into a proper goddess, she needs worship through piety and prayer. Prayer, devotion, everything done in her name that follows the tenets she champions, will both honor and strengthen her. And as she grows stronger, so will her ability to watch over us in not just the world of the living, but the hereafter as well. While Reed's reasoning was not universally accepted by those in the room, they could all agree that she was worthy of their devotion and faith. Every last one of them had felt the pull of her alicorn magic on numerous occasions. A few like Yakim imagined that they felt echoes of her still lingering on their spirit. One of the mares in the crowd shouted above the din. What aspect is she? Everyone, Reed included, faced the beige mare with a shared but unspoken question. The beige pegasus recoiled a bit from the attention, but found her voice again after a few seconds. Well it's just that it seems alicorns have an aspect right? Celestia and the sun, twilight with magic she trailed off for the others to catch the hint. Reed lowered his hoof as both he and the crowd threw out a few suggestions, but nothing felt right to everyone until Joachim made his own. Each alicorn's aspect is tied to their cutie mark is it not? Our princess possesses the ankh for a mark, so would her aspect be of life then? Yes. Of course. Yes. Reed cheered at the idea. Princess Alexia, the alicorn of life. After the group gave a round of approval at the idea for a few minutes, Reed raised a quieting hoof. Now, we all know our princess's view on worshipping her, so we have the dubious honor of being the only religion where we can touch our god, but can't let her know we worship her. He nodded his head in sympathy as many grumbled sadly at such a fate. To that end, we must keep our devotion hidden. Convert those you think can be both devout and secretive. A mare at the back of the room shouted to be heard. Aren't we being a little hypocritical? If we truly wish to honor the princess, shouldn't we abide her wishes and refrain from worshipping her? Reed had a pained expression dance across his face before a fatherly smile replaced it. Under any other circumstance, obeying the goddess would be paramount above all else. We all know Alexia makes for an excellent leader and princess, but he paused as if the words were difficult to voice. As a deity she is still young and fallible. I see us as her children, he said with a hint of reverent mirth, and sometimes it takes a child to raise a family. I have no doubt that she will accept her role as our goddess in due time. Just as she was hesitant to take up the crown in days past, so will she one day accept the mantle of goddess and upon that day we can shout her praises to the heavens and she will look upon us as those who helped her along the path of the benevolent and wise goddess I know she is destined to be. The mare's troubled mind was placated, along with all the others who shared her concerns. Joachim looked upon the large portrait of Alexia hanging behind Reed. It was an oil painting that depicted her lying upon a bench with a sovereign expression and her crown upon her brow. The sight of it stirred feelings of pride, faith, and love. Yes. Princessa is worthy of us. And it is up to us to make sure she becomes a goddess who will lead our people to a brighter future. He marched up to the front and stood beside Reed before facing the assembled ponies. Then let us begin working towards that day at this very moment. Let it be known among us that we hold the Reverend Mother in our hearts and prayers. He turned to Reed. You gathered us preacher. Would you do us the honor of leading the first group prayer? A nearby mare interjected. Wait. We need a name first. Reed looked first at Joachim and then to the questioner. Indeed we do, his eyes lit up as an idea came to him quickly. For now, we shall be the congregation of life. As our numbers grow, so too will our goddess. He got off the chair. Now let us bow our heads, and pray to lend our strength to the goddess. May her heart always lie with us as ours does with hers. With Reed leading the way, the nearly three dozen ponies bowed before Alexia's portrait and joined in prayer. Asterisk. It was late the next morning when Alexia awoke feeling extremely sore. Her legs were throbbing, her wings ached, and despite her claims to the contrary, her horn was in pain from the exertions from the previous night. It was her horn ache of all things that wounded her pride as it dragged the bleary mare into the waking world. The first thing she saw was the blue and white striped bottom of the top bunk. 
the bush's captain had offered her an empty officer's quarters, but none of the free ones had a bed that could fit all four of them. So rather than have two of their number sleep on the floor, or be in separate rooms, the herd decided to sleep in one of the rooms that had six bunks. There had been a few that were unoccupied so the herd was more than happy to claim one for their own. It was not the accommodations Toon was hoping for, but it was the best she was going to get on a warship. Wish I could call Beth and see how the foals are doing. The silver mare dared not bring a picture of her family. All it would take is that image falling into the wrong hands and Elizabeth, Violet, Aurora, Dusty, and the Andersons could all end up as targets of war. I hope Violet hasn't burned the house down. Spark's smiling face materialized in her mind's eye. Toon imagined that she was cradling both of her daughters in her forelegs with Dusty Tinker worming his way to be in the center of it all. A sad laugh escaped her lips at knowing it was just her imagination. Even so, the silver mare hugged them closely. She mimicked her imagination in the real world by hugging herself. Alexia smiled at the thought of her children as several longing tears rolled into her fur. Hang on little ones. Mama will come home as soon as she can. She hugged herself for a few more minutes before acknowledging the cold reality of the foal's absence. I love you girls. Don't drive Beth crazy okay? The Elicorn performed a few breathing exercises to level her emotions to a neutral state. Upon her fifth exercise she started a personal mantra at the inhale. Emotional peace through harmony. Change is inevitable. As life changes, I must adapt or be swept away in the current. She repeated this several times until her racing thoughts and heart slowed to normal. Since she was still on the job, Toon felt it was prudent to recite one last mantra. Get the right information to the right person at the right time or somebody dies. At that moment, Alexia finished reconstructing herself from the vulnerable mother to that of a special agent of the CIA. Testing her limbs, Toon gingerly leapt from the center of the three bunk high stack of beds to the ground. Putting on a tough show for that bastard Harold didn't do my body any favors. She stretched and generally loosened her joints up and gave her wings a few flaps to get the blood flowing. The Elicorn glanced about the room, it was compact and spartan as she expected. Alexia's mates were absent, and their harnesses hung on a nearby rung. Must be grabbing some breakfast. I should do the same before Mercer's briefing. The mare still preferred to brush her teeth after breakfast, so she took one of the smaller satchels and placed the necessary items within after taking a quick shower, preforming a cursory preen on her feathers, and brushing out her mane, tail, and coat. The activity took too long for her liking. Bah! I'm too used to preparing for the camera instead of making myself presentable for work. She stopped trying to style her bangs to flow around her horn just right and settled on keeping the steel, two-toned crimson, and pink stripes on the left side and the solid azure on the right. Finally done. She turned about face just in the nick of time to see Crimson, Conrad, and Loki return from their meal with Conrad carrying a takeout box on his back. Toon didn't know if she should be miffed about missing a chance to eat in the carrier's mess hall or be glad that her mates brought breakfast to her. Well there's always lunch. The silver mare's mood brightened up and she affectionately nuzzled Loki who was closest. Hey guys. Sorry I slept in. Loki cooed wistfully with the physical display of affection. You're still the mare I love. The green pony closed her eyes while she reciprocated her alpha's nuzzle. Don't worry about it. After what we went through last night, and all the spells you were slinging, you needed a good night's rest. The two mares separated so Alexia could nuzzle Crimson and Conrad before finally getting to her lukewarm breakfast. Did Mercer tell you when our daily briefing is going to be held? The silver pony said to no one in particular as she levitated the white styrofoam box over to hover in front of her. Within laid a treasure trove of bacon, scrambled eggs, and buttered toast. Said he needed to get word back from the home office about the op last night. As for your breakfast however, Conrad wore a superior grin at seeing the mare's jaw hang open and the look of sheer delight in her eyes. After such a workout last night, I figured your magic could use some extra protein. He could not be any closer to the truth. 
The moment her eyes and nose beheld the meal before her, the floodgates opened and the hunger she had mostly ignored up until now drove itself to the forefront of her mind so fast it caused a headache. Alexia abandoned any pretense of ladylike mannerisms and started wolfing down the eggs and bacon with gusto. Oh you have no idea, she said between bites, how freak and much I needed bacon right now. Crimson fished out a can of apple juice from her small saddlebag and waved it in front of the silver mare's eyes only to have it snatched away by her kinesis and guzzled down within a minute. Loki took a playful step back as a dollop of egg flew out of the floating box of food and nearly hit the green mare's leg. Should we get a second plate? The azure-crowned pony exhaled in relief as the last bit of toast flew down her gullet. She had a look of mild contentment. I could use a second plate. Mana doesn't just pop out of the air for free after all, and I'm still recharging from last night. The alicorn was offered a napkin by Crimson who graciously accepted. The thing is, while I can store an exorbitant amount of mana, I can only produce mana at the same rate I did if I was hovering around 20% back when I used to be a unicorn. At least for now, she added quietly. She shook it off to continue speaking normally. It's a lot but it'll take more than a night's sleep and some bacon to replenish all that I expended last night. Loki wrapped a hoof around Alexia's withers and started dragging her to the door. Well you didn't oversleep that much, they'll still be serving breakfast for another hour or so. Right before she left the room, Toon turned back to her harness and levitated the necklace off of it and clasped it around her neck. What is a princess without her crown? Come on. You can't imagine how hungry I still am. The once filled to the brim takeout box found its way in the trash bin completely bare of food. This caused Loki to eye the silver pony with curiosity. Eating that much? You're not pregnant again are you? Alexia shared a chuckle with the others until a seed of worry wormed its way in. I was fooling around with Conrad before all this started. Her horn lit up a second later as she cast inner sight to be sure and breathed a sigh of relief. No baby in me. Just really famished. Conrad let out a breath of relief. I love my kids, but we can barely handle three as it is. At least they're good company, Crimson added with fond remembrance of her son. The rest made nonverbal sounds of agreement while they carefully navigated to one of the very steep stairwells of the ship. The two-toned red-crowned mare grimaced at the cursed steps. These stairs on the other hand. Conrad simply dove down the first flight, as he did before, and flared his wings to break his fall to come to a graceful landing. The two earth mares gingerly crept down them, much to the amusement of the passing sailors. Alexia watched her fellow mares difficulties from the top of the first flight. With the stairwell being so close to the wall, my wings are too large to try what Conrad did. I could just blink down but it might not be the best thing to show that ability off at every opportunity. Not to mention I'd like to preserve as much mana for the next mission as possible so I don't have to worry about restraint. She didn't like the images her brain pulled up that depicted her as a giant battery with a comparatively slow recharge. Dashing such thoughts aside, Alexia mulled over the difficulties of walking down the stairs from the front, so instead she tried to descend backwards. It was a pain but was far easier on her physiology than trying to descend forward. The soul Pegasus eyed his alpha with a snide touch of mirth as she made her way down. And here I thought a larger wingspan would always be an asset. So did I, she replied with a barely amused snort. Anyway, lead on to the mess hall. Asterisk. End of part 2